good evening to everybody who has joined us i know it's very difficult to join in after a hectic day and um, i hope i just do justice to your expectations so um, as navdeep has already told today we will be uh, discussing a little about the drugs that we commonly use in ophthalmology and let me just find my slides second i'm sorry for this yes so a uh, practical ocular ophthalmology now why i chose this topic was that a lot of time uh, we are asked to write the management of a particular disease entity and uh, when uh, your viva voce is going on you just name the drug and you don't really know too much about the drug in fact in your uh, grand viva there is one counter where there are several drugs that are kept so i thought why not address it in detail so that you can write not just the notes uh, related to any disease entity and their management and also you can prescribe your drugs better to your patient and also do a great job at the viva voce so the learning objectives of today's webinar include uh, a basic guidelines of the ocular drug delivery we would be putting special uh, focus on midriatics and cycloplegics antimicrobials and anti glaucoma drugs so uh, you all have passed pharmacology and you are aware that for any drug we need to know the biological and the therapeutic effect of the drug and that is known as the mechanism of action of the drug most drugs can act either by binding to the regulatory macromolecules which can be neurotransmitters or hormonal receptors or enzymes if the drug is working at the receptor level it can either be agonist as in friendly with that receptor or antagonist as in the enemy to the receptor if the drug is working at the enzyme level it can either be an activator or inhibitor so this is how when you are describing a drug you need to address the mechanism and tell at what level it is working the pharmacokinetics on the other hand they um, cover absorption of the drug the drug distribution the metabolism and excretion of the drug now when it comes to eye and you're putting the drug in the eye you can either go locally it can be eye drops it can be an eye ointment it can be an injection in the eyeball which is intraocular injection or just around the eyeball which is a periocular injection or if the disease really wants to be given complete attention because it has some systemic component to it you can go and give the drugs orally or as an intravenous agent so broadly we can have topical drugs which can be given as drops ointment gel or a soft contact lens which has been impregnated with the drug periocularly subconjunctival injection beneath the conjunctiva subtenin injection under the tenin capsule a peribulbar injection which is just around the globe usually it is uh, used to give anesthesia to the eye a retrobulbar injection which is now obsolete but here we used to again give anesthesia or certain other drugs going way back behind the globe but it's quite a blind technique and runs risks of some complication so it's no longer used anymore when it comes to giving the injection in the eyeball that is intraocular intracameral means that you are injecting the drug in the anterior chamber and intravitreal means you are injecting the drug in the vitreous cavity systemically as you all know we can either give the drug orally intravenously or intramuscularly now this may appear boring to you but when you look at the appropriate drug that needs to be given this has a very practical implication now there are several factors which influence the local drug penetration into the ocular tissue one is the drug concentration and the solubility higher the concentration the better the penetration viscosity now if we add methyl cellulose or polyvinyl alcohol it increases the drug penetration 
by increasing the contact time with the cornea and altering corneal epithelium. Now, there are some patients who have very extremely dry eyes, secondary to certain systemic conditions like Jogren syndrome or any other connective tissue disorder. Now, if we just put artificial tears in their eyes, the tears will be drained out through the nasolacrimal duct and the eyes will become dry in no time. Therefore, in such patients, we use a more viscous pre preparation, which has methyl cellulose and coats the surface for much longer. And since the surface stays coated for a long time, the drug gets adequate time to penetrate and bring about the desired effect. Similarly, lipid solubility is also very important. Higher the lipid solubility, more the penetration. And the drugs can pass either through the cell, each cell, or between the space of two cells. So transcellular, which is through the cells, and paracellular between the cells. Now, a drug can either be amphipathic, if it passes easily through the epithelium. It can be lipophilic, if it passes easily through the endothelium, or hydrophilic, passing through the stroma. There are several barriers. It can be pre-corneal barrier, conjunctival barrier, corneal barriers to several drugs. So their drugs have no easy way into your eye. The tight junctions of the epithelial cells, the hydrophobic nature of the corneal epithelium, they all limit the penetration of hydrophilic drugs. So hydrophobic nature of the corneal epithelium limits penetration of many drugs, including the penicillin groups. So, you know, we have to be very, very uh, particular as to which drug we are giving. In front of the cornea, there is a tear film. The tear turnover, the nasolacrimal drug drainage, as I already mentioned, they all have an influence on the drug penetration. Now, the pH of the normal tear film is 7.4. So if somebody tells you that after putting a certain eye drop, my eyes are stinging, that means the pH is slightly towards the acidic side. So it may lead to reflex tearing. And if there is reflex tearing, the eye drops that you have put may just get drained out via the tears. So in such patients where the drug has been made a little acidic, after putting a drop of the drug, we sometimes tell the patients to put the drop of an artificial tear so that there is no reflex steering. Or we tell the patient to put refrigerant. Uh, surfactants are also very important. Every drug has a preservative. So these preservatives, they alter the cell membrane in the cornea and they cause some amount of damage over a period of time which may lead to increased drug permeability, which is good. But over a period of time, these uh, preservatives, they cause damage to the ocular surface. So you have to see what are the surfactants. And now we are moving on to preservative-free drugs. Although they are a little expensive than the ones which are preserved, but they are very good for the ocular surface. The tonicity of the drug is also very important because when an alkaloid drug is put in a relatively alkaloid medium, the proportion of the uncharged form increases and it increases the penetration. So it's important to know what is the nature of the drug as regards its tonicity. The molecules which are larger in size, they are a little difficult to penetrate as compared to the molecules which are relatively smaller in size. So let's come to topical drops. Now, um, in your MCQs, you can be given a question that how much is the volume of one eye, one drop which is instilled in the eye. So one drop actually measures 50 microliters and the conjunctival sac, this if you pull your eyelid, the inferior fornix, the conjunctival sac here, it's just 7 to 13 microliters. So even if after putting one drop, some drop goes out or there is some spillage, there is enough that could have been absorbed through the phonesial conjunctiva. So usually patients have a tendency to put more than one drop, so two or three drops. So actually the drug is going waste. One drop is way more than what actually is the capacity of the conjunctival sac. 
the method to put the drop is that you pull the lower lid and pull it forward so that there is a, a sort of a depression that is seen and then you instill the drop and you close the eye and occlude the uh, punctum so that there is a increased drug absorption and 50 percent of the drug remains after of installation. So this can also come as an MCQ question and only 10% of the drug reaches the aqueous humor. So when we do compression of the nasolacrimal duct like this with our finger, it decreases the systemic absorption and therefore reduces the systemic adverse effects of the drugs that you're putting. So why it is relevant? Because say, for example, we are putting Timolol eye drops for managing glaucoma. And the patient is also uh, a hypertensive patient and taking some antihypertensive drug. Now, this stimulol is also going to be absorbed in the systemic circulation. It is also a beta blocker, as we all know. So this will have additional contribution to the already, uh, uh, already uh, the drugs that the patient is taking. So it can contribute to additional side effects. So we have to keep that in mind in order to reduce systemic adverse effects we have to decrease systemic absorption. Logically, as the ointments are viscous and sticky, they would increase the contact time of the ocular drug that you're putting. And sometimes they give a comfortable soothing effect to the uh, otherwise rough surface, which can be there because of any pathology. The drug has to be highly lipid soluble with some water solubility to have the maximum effect as an ointment. The problem with ointments is that they cause vision blurring. So usually ointments are prescribed at bedtime when the patient is just about to go to sleep. When they wake up in the morning, because of the ointment, the vision would be blurry. So we always tell the patient to clean their eye with lukewarm water dipped in a cotton pledget. So these are small instructions which you give to the patient. They are very relevant and you end up with a satisfied patient. Coming to periocular injections, they reach behind the iris lens diaphragm. They have better uh, penetration than the topical application. So as I already mentioned, you can give under the conjunctiva, under the tenens capsule or peribulbar or retrobulbar. They bypass the conjunctival and corneal epithelium, which is good for drugs with low lipid solubility because the lipid solubility, if it is low, the drugs will not be able to go in the eye. Uh, so here we have an injection that is being given just under the conjunctiva. You can see the ballooned conjunctiva. The tenens capsule is very strongly adherent to the sclera. Therefore, after a subtenens capsule, you don't have a very pronounced ballooning. And here we have a peribulbar injection, which is being given outside the eye, just along the orbital rim. Intraocular injections include intracameral, that is within the anterior chamber, and usually during the cataract surgery, the surgeons give intracameral moxifloxus and antibiotic, or if they want to constrict the pupil, they give uh, intracameral acetylcholine or pilocarpin. Uh, intravitrally, within the vitreous cavity, the drugs that are given are antibiotics and steroids. Antibiotics are usually given in cases of endophthalmitis, while steroids and anti-VEGF drugs are given in cases with diabetic macular edema. Now, it's very important to note the distance from the limbus when you are giving intravitreal injection. So this can also come as an MCQ question in your exam. If you have a patient with the natural lens, for them, if you give it closer than 4 millimeter, your needle might accidentally damage the lens and cause cataract. Therefore, in such cases, the intravitreal injection is given about four millimeters away from the limbus. So we measure using a vernier caliper and give the intravitreal injection four millimeters away from the limbus. For a pseudophagic eye, that is the eye with an intraocular lens implant, it is given 3.5 millimeters away. And for an aphagic eye where there is no lens at all, it is given three millimeters away from the limbus. In certain uh, diseases, we need to implant sustained release devices within the eye where the drug 
keeps on uh, getting released from these devices over a longer period of time at a much steady state. So for example, uh, earlier we used to have Ocucert implants delivering pilocarpin. These days, GAN cyclovir implants, which are in the form of a screw, are they are implanted in the eye, especially in cases with the CMV retinitis in patients with the HIV. Uh, GAN cyclovir sustained release intraocular devices are used. There are also collagen shields which are soaked in the drug and implanted over the eye to cause sustained delivery of drugs. So there are several classes of drugs. Midriatics and cycloplegics, antibiotics, anti glaucoma drugs, antivirals, antifungals, anti allergics, anti inflammatory, and anti VEGF, to name a few for an ophthalmologist. So, I would be addressing the top three for this particular uh, webinar, and the remaining we will cover in part two. Before we go on to the drugs per se, it is very important to know the autonomic regulation of the drugs. You know, if you know which receptor, which drug is acting upon, then you would know the response that drug is going to bring about. So there are several receptors in this area. We have alpha one, beta receptors, alpha two, beta two, and the muscarinic receptors. So the iris, radial muscle and the sphincter muscle, we need either to constrict it or to dilate it. For dilation, it's the alpha receptors when come into play. And for the constriction or meiosis, we have the muscarinic receptors M2 and M3. When you want to contract or relax your ciliary muscle, that is to accommodate while you're trying to read or you know, focus more on a near object or a distant object, then for relaxation of the ciliary muscle, it is the beta receptor for contraction, it is the muscarinic receptor. Now, I'll just give you a small tip here to remember. Wherever you want to constrict or contract, it is the muscarinic receptors. So anything which is getting squeezed, you will remember muscarinic receptors. The alpha-2 receptors on the ciliary epithelium, they decrease the production of aqueous humor, while beta-2, they enhance the production of aqueous humor. Now, this aqueous humor also has to travel outside the eye via the trabecular meshwork. The beta-2 receptors, they decrease the resistance of the trabecular meshwork, while the muscarinic ones, they increase the resistance. So in increasing the resistance also, they're causing a sort of a constrictive effect on the trabecular meshwork. So wherever there is a constrictive effect, think of muscarinic receptors. So coming to midriatics and cycloplegics, Mitriasis means dilatation of pupil. And when, in addition to dilatation of pupil, we have ciliary muscle paralysis, we think of cycloplegics. Now, they can be classified into short acting, intermediate acting, or long acting. Usually, when you see a patient in an OPD, you want to have a good view of their fundus, but you also want them to get back when they get back home after a few hours, their vision gets back to normal. So there you need a short acting agent like tropicamide. So you desire only midriasis. So you give tropicamide and usually in children, tropicamide alone itself is enough. But for adults, we take it mixed with phenylephrine. For children, uh, we also need to relax their accommodation. The amount of convergence and accommodation is way more in children as compared to adults. Therefore, we need cycloplegia, that means relaxation of the ciliary muscles, so as to know the exact refractive error in children. So we use these drugs there. These drugs are also used in treatment of certain disease entities such as corneal ulcer and uveitis. So for a child over three months, but less than five years, we use atropine. Atropine ointment is preferred over drops because the ointment stays locally. And if you put drops, the drops are absorbed in the systemic circulation and may sometimes cause a febrile episode for the child. So ointment preferred over drops given twice a day for three days. And after three days, the next day when the child comes for cycloplegic refraction, we tell the patient not to put the ointment. And then once you do atropine retinoscopy, you call the patient 
two weeks after retinoscopy to give them the exact acceptance of glasses because the duration of action of atropine is two weeks. Similarly, from five to about 10 years, we do use home atropine for the children. The midriasis comes in early, but cycloplegia takes time for all the drugs. And the duration of action is about four days. So you usually call the patient after four days to give them their final prescription. For children over 10 years and up to about 13 or 14 years, cyclopentolate is used for cycloplegic refraction, one drop, 0.5%, twice or thrice. And in eyes with very dark iris, you can use one person twice or thrice. The effect of the drug usually goes after NR. So whenever we are doing cycloplegic refraction in children, we usually ask about their exams, you know, if they are around the corner, avoid doing cycloplegic refraction so that the child can get back to normal functioning. So the common MCQs that come related to uh, midriatics and cycloplegics include uh, which is the fastest acting midriatic and cycloplegic, the answer to which you all know is tropicamide. It is also the shortest acting midriatic and cycloplegic. And which drug causes only midriasis without cycloplegia? The answer to this is phenylephrine. Now, somebody can ask you, in which children would you prefer a cycloplegic refraction? So those children in which there is a constant or an intermittent convergent squint. You see that the eyes are, both the pupil and the, the eyes are crossed inside on the initial presentation. You want to know their exact refractive error so that you give them the precise glass correction and giving the precise glass correction itself can realign the eyes. In children and young adults with asthenopic symptoms, that is where they say that my eyes are getting exhausted after reading so much. So the exhaustion is coming from over attempt of converging to the converging and accommodating at the task that they are doing. Also in children with young adults with esophoria, eso means inside and exo means outside. So esophoria means exhaustion when the child is looking inside exhausted eyes and esotropia means it is a manifest inward devi deviation. Whenever the child or the adult says there is fluctuating accommodation, some days they are able to read properly without much effort and the other days it is very difficult. Then we have this gamut of entities related to accommodation, accommodative insufficiency, accommodative fatigue, accommodative inertia and spasm of accommodation. Now, uh, I'll be addressing this in the subsequent slide, but they are very, very relevant when it comes to doing cycloplegic refraction. Sometimes the refraction, that is the act of giving the glasses without cycloplegia can be very variable. And sometimes this refraction is not viable also due to the disabilities which an individual may have. So in those cases to have a reliable output, it is better to put cycloplegic drops. So coming to the terminologies that we saw in the previous slide, Accommodative insufficiency means that the patient or the person has persistently low accommodation as per age. Now, if I'm 30 years old, I should be able to accommodate and read the near print properly. But as I get older, this accommodation will reduce. But if even at the age of 30, I'm not able to read the finer print of a newspaper, that means I have accommodative insufficiency. Accommodative fatigue means normal accommodative amplitude, but repeated stimulation of, of accommodation causes fatigue. Now, I am able to read the newspaper for 10 minutes, but if you tell me to read a finer print for a very, very long time, I get fatigued. So to start with, I was okay. But over a period of time, it becomes tiring. Accommodative inertia, means difficulty with stimulation and relaxation of response to accommodate due to slower accommodation dynamics. 
I am trying to read the newspaper, but I take good four five minutes to be able to bring the finer print into focus. That is accommodative inertia, and spasm of accommodation means that there is a spasm of the accommodative system due to ciliary muscles. So ciliary spasm can happen due to uh, certain drugs like pilocarpine or certain uh, pathological conditions as well. Like uveitis also leads to some amount of ciliary spasm, and in those cases, we give atropine to relieve the spasm. So, practical tips for improving the uh, cycloplegic refraction is to use the lowest concentration of the drug to call, tell the patient to simply close the eyelid for two minutes after they are given a drop. And before putting cycloplegic in anybody's eyes, we need to take a thorough medical ocular history because some drugs they cause periocular hyperemia, marked itching, and some excoriation of the skin. So you know, taking a good history of drug allergy is very important, especially to atropine. Many many patients are allergic. Always check vision at distance and near before dilating. After you dilate, you will not be able to know what was the uncorrected visual equity of the individual. You should also check the binocular status. Do a thorough slit lamp examination. Check the pupillary function, and do intraocular pressure examination. Look at the fundus and check the amplitude of accommodation pre-cycloplegia. You can either use a RAF ruler, or there is a formula where you are not using a RAF ruler. Um, just remember for your sake that the amplitude of accommodation is maximum at birth. It is about 18 diopters. This can come as an MCQ question. And for every three years of age, it reduces by one diopter. So here you see the process of accommodation happening as the lens gets uh, as the there is accommodation, the lens anterior posterior dia it increases. See here again, the anterior posterior dia is increasing. Second category of drugs that we would be covering today is anti-glaucoma drugs. So we have five classes of topical anti-glaucomas: prostaglandin analogs, beta blockers, alpha agonist carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, and cholinergic agents. Now there are newer categories also that have been added, such as ROC inhibitors. But for the scope of an MBBS syllabus, I would stick to these. Systemically, also if the pressures are really high, we can use hyperosmotic agents or oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So mostly we are giving them for primary and secondary open angle glaucoma, normal pressure glaucoma, and primary and secondary angle closure glaucoma after an iridotomy. It was due to a pupillary block. So the first and the foremost is the prostaglandins and hypotensive liquids. Now, prostaglandins have nine types of receptors throughout the body. Out of these, two are present in the eye. And this can come as an MCQ question. So PGFP and PGE are located on the Schlem's canal and the trabecular meshwork. So remember PGFP and PGE. The classification of these drugs can be into prostanoids, prostamides, and docosanoids. Uh, the newest drug that has been added in this group is tafluoprost. It is very different from its predecessors, and this difference is what can make it as an MCQ question. It has a very strong affinity for the FP receptor, approximately 12 times higher than that of carboxylic acid of latinoprost. So the drug with the most affinity to an FP receptor is tafluoprost. So you would imagine that this drug would be the most efficacious of this class. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So you remember that this is a newer drug with more affinity, but its potential to bind to other receptors is very limited. And that is what limits its efficacy. All the prostaglandins, they are absorbed through the cornea, whereas where uh, the esterase enzyme it hydrolyzes the prodrug and changes into its biologically active acid form. Now, I will not go into the details. Just remember 
that there is an esterase enzyme in the cornea which is hydrolyzing this drug and all these drugs are initially available as prodrugs and they are activated by this enzyme to the active acid form they decrease the intraocular pressure by about 25 to 30% of the baseline level they their action lasts for more than 24 hours they are usually given at bedtime because when you instill prostaglandin analogs, they cause some amount of redness in the eye. Now, this redness, uh, once you sleep, it usually subsides by the time the patient wakes up. So it's better to give these drugs at bedtime. Their action usually starts about three to four hours after installation. And the maximum effect of these drugs is around eight to 12 hours after installation. Now, tafluoprost, again, also starts acting most rapidly after two hours. So again, this can come as a MCQ, which is the most rapidly acting prostaglandin analog. So the answer is tafluoprost. Now, as I mentioned, you can see that the eye is very red. The conjunctiva of the bulbar conjunctiva is quite congested. So conjunctival hyperemia is a very, very common uh, adverse effect. And the matoprost amongst the prostaglandins is most notorious for causing conjunctival hyperemia. So if somebody has glaucoma only in one eye, so usually patients with secondary glaucoma because of some other reason, if you give them prostaglandin analogs, they will have one eye which is slightly congested as compared to the other eye. Not only that, these drugs, they will start looking like a panda, not one I, uh, I mean, a panda like this. And not only that, these drugs also cause eyelash lengthening. So they will have one eye with long lashes and the other with the normal lashes. So usually prostaglandins are avoided in unilateral conditions. So as I mentioned, uh, they cause uh, transient conjunctival hyperemia. They also cause lash lengthening and darkening of the eyelashes. They cause small, vellus hair growth around the eyelid skin, periocular hyperpigmentation. You can see the dark eyes around the eye. The iris also sometimes gets discolored. But in Indians, it is not very pronounced because we already have a very dark iris. Superficial punctate keratitis also happens. Dry eyes, constant irritation. And in patients who have a tendency for macular edema, such as patients with active uveitis, <clears throat> excuse me, these drugs also cause cystoid macular edema. Coming to the next class of anti-glaucoma drugs, that is the beta blockers. So we have non-selective beta blockers and the selective ones. The selective ones, although um, they are okay with patients who have uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, but they are not very commonly used because of limited efficacy. So amongst the commonly used one is Timolol only. It comes as Timolol maleate, 0.25 and 0.5%. 0.25% used for children and 0.5% for adults twice a day. The IOP lowering efficacy is about 20 to 30% from baseline. So say, for example, the baseline pressure was 30 millimeters of mercury, after putting a timolol, it will be 20% or 30% less than that of 30. These drugs, like all beta blockers, can also have the phenomenon of short-term escape. Initially, it will work very well, but the effect will disappear after a few weeks. So short-term, good result, and then it escapes. Long-term drifters, for a very long time, they work okay. Uh, but after a year or so, they start the effect starts drifting out. The mechanism of action of beta blockers is by inhibiting the cyclic AMP in the ciliary epithelium and by decreasing the aqueous production. If the production is less, the outflow will be okay. The beta blockers have adverse effects, I think, on every organ system. So cardiovascular system, it can lead to heart failure, bradycardia, postural hypertension, intensification of an existing AV block, 
For pulmonary, it can cause worsening of bronchial asthma. Neurologically, they can cause sleep disturbances, depression. And this is something that we always forget to ask our patients because it doesn't just come to our mind that, you know, we need to ask about these small things, which are very, very big for an individual. Uh, they have GI adverse effects. They cause uh, dry eyes, visual disturbances, and um, they can mask hypoglycemia in at-risk patients. So it's very risky in a diabetic to give them a timolol. They also reduce the high-density lipoprotein level. So it's quite unfavorable for the lipid profile of the individual. So bromonidine and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are a much safer alternative to beta blockers in geriatric patients with glaucoma. So this too can come as an option for uh, your MCQs. The contraindications include cardiogenic shock, overt cardiac failure, as I already mentioned, COPD, reactive asthma, sinus bradycardia. Remember, topical beta blockers have the same systemic effects as 20 milligram of oral beta blockers. So we have to be very cautious and not take them lightly. Since it can mask the symptoms of diabetic-related hypoglycemia, it can also cause impaired glucose tolerance. So caution to be given to a diabetic. It can also mask the symptoms of thyrotoxicosis and it can cause lethargy and confusion in newborns. So the dosage has to be adjusted and timolol is actively secreted in breast milk and is concentrated. So it should be uh, given to the mother also if the mother is a glaucoma patient with caution. Coming to the third category, the alpha agonists, to, the non-selective ones are no longer available in the market. The selective ones, aproclonidin, not very commonly used anywhere across the globe. Brimonidin is the only most commonly available as well as used alpha agonist. It is given in the dosage of thrice daily. It, if it is given as a fixed dose combination, that is a brimonidine with timolol, both in one bottle, that's called as a fixed dose combination, then it is given twice a day. 20 to 30% reduction of pressure from the baseline level, and it reduces intraocular pressure within one hour of installation, which is way faster than the prostaglandin analogs. Now, they decrease the cyclic AMP, just like timolol, they also decrease the episcleral venous pressure. Therefore, they increase the outflow also. So, brimonidine is the drug which decreases aqueous production and also increases aqueous outflow via the uveoscleral pathway. So, this can come as an MCQ. If you are given a choice of prostaglandins, beta blockers and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and you are asked that which drug has a dual mechanism of action, then the answer to that is an alpha agonist, which is primonidine. Now, the advantage is good, but look at the disadvantages. The amount of drug allergy that happens with this drug is uh, really, really very common and very debilitating for the patients. They cause very severe periocular contact dermatitis in many patients, blepharoconjunctivitis, follicular conjunctivitis. Um, systemically, they cause dry mouth, headache, dizziness, and drowsiness. So if we are giving this drug thrice a day, we usually don't give it to factory workers who are working around heavy machinery or to professional drivers because the drowsiness can make them prone to accidents. In children less than six years or weighing less than 20 kgs, we don't give this drug because it's contraindicated as it crosses the blood-brain barrier and can cause cyanosis and coma in these children. Coming to the next category, that is the carbonic and hydrous inhibitors. Orally, the one that is available in India is acetazolamide. And topically, we have two drugs, dorzolamide and brinzolamide. If you are giving them alone, then thrice a day, just like brimonidine. But if they are in fixed drug combination with timolol in one bottle, twice a day. The mean pressure reduction from baseline is 20%. So you see the most efficacious was prostaglandin followed by beta blockers. The others are at par to each other. They are to be given with caution in patients who are allergic to sulfonamides. So you can get a sort of a dummy case scenario in which you are given 
the history that the patient is allergic to sulfa drugs and which anti glaucoma drug should not be given to them so remember the answer is carbonic anhydrase inhibitors they should also be avoided in patients with corneal transplant that those who have undergone a keratoplasty because they can decompensate the corneal graft that the patient has received and uh, if you are asked that out of uh, the given uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors which one is the suspension acetazolamide methazolamide brinzolamide or dorzolamide the answer is brinzolamide as it is it it's since it is a suspension it needs to be shaken before instilling these drugs also interact with diuretics and with aspirin so concomitant use is risky coming to the last category of the and uh, topical anti glaucoma drugs that is pilocarpin which is a cholinergic drug it works both for angle closure and open angle glaucoma although the mechanism of action is different in angle closure it causes constriction and the angle which was closed because of crowding there the peripheral iris is pulled away from the angle and it leads to opening up of the angle and in open angle glaucoma it stimulates the ciliary muscle by virtue of its traction on the scleral spur and trabecular meshwork the trabecular sheets are separated and the there is a more open uh, trabecular outflow mic pathway pilocarpin <clears throat> is usually given just prior to doing a laser iridotomy for angle closure glaucoma it's not the primary choice of drugs because it too like beta blocker has several side effects it causes induced near accommodation so in it uh, causes an induced myopia it causes severe frontal headache and the patients who are younger they have more pronounced adverse effects they also cause uh, posterior synechia formation and in post operative cases the inflammation is much more uh, pronounced with pilocarpin they also cause retinal holes retinal detachment and patients who are myopes especially so you know since there are so many adverse effects it's not used as a drug of choice for managing glaucoma but prior to doing a laser iridotomy in uh, an angle closure patient just to constrict the pupil they're usually given now sometimes the patients can have very high pressure 50 60 then the drugs which are given topically will not work because to work they have to be absorbed in the blood vessels which are there in the iris now because of high pressure those blood vessels are not able to absorb these drugs so for first we need to bring down the high pressures so that the topical drugs can start working so mannitol or glycerol are the hyperosmotic agents which increase the osmolality of the plasma they suck out the uh, fluid from the vitreous cavity the water is drawn out from the vitreous into the systemic circulation and then the uh, pressures they fall down and once the pressures are reduced the topical drugs are started now if you don't know the diabetic status of the patient mannitol is the safest choice uh, but prior to giving mannitol since you are going to cause a fluid overload in the body always blood pressure should be checked and the mannitol bottle should also be checked because it should be transparent and if you see crystals like this in the bottle the bottle should be discarded the duration of effect of mannitol is 6 hours so it will bring down the uh, pressure but you need to act fast and add the topical drugs so they can do the rest glycerol in some patients if you want a short lived effect can be used but it's contraindicated in diabetics it's too sweet to be taken and usually take 6 to uh, teaspoons are needed thrice a day uh, but it's very unpalatable and it doesn't really work for long so not really used much since there is a fluid overload happening because of these hyperosmotic agents they lead to headache due to cerebral dehydration there is increased diuresis urinary retention can be seen in adults who have bph and renal failure is also a relative contraindication for this class of drugs coming to the last category for today the systemic antibiotics are not very commonly used by us but they are very very important when we have uh, infections which involve the systemic circulation 
So our boital cellulitis or preceptal cellulitis, in these scenarios, they, we have to resort to systemic medications. So antibiotics are used topically for prophylaxis and treatment of the bacterial infections of the eye. They are used in tablet form for treatment of preceptal cellulitis. They're used intravenously for treatment of orbital cellulitis, and they can be injected as intravitreal drugs for endothelitis. Now, from your pharmacology, you all know the generations of cephalosporins. Uh, the most commonly used generations are third and fourth generation. We use uh, topical ceftriaxone uh, and IV also in patients with the uh, uh, gram negative uh, in co infections and used in uh, corneal ulcers. Cefotaxim is especially good as it has good penetration uh, beyond the blood ocular barrier. The fourth generation is the most preferred one as it has an extended spectrum. Uh, they, it works against the gram positive organisms. It has a greater resistance to beta lactamases and it can even cross the blood brain barrier. So it's quite effective when you have to deal with an orbital cellulitis. And especially if the patient is admitted for long in the hospital, it also works against the nosocomial pathogens. Coming to fluoroquinolones, the commonly used ones prior to the current day and age were ciprofloxacin, ofloxacin, but ciprofloxacin has been known to leave deposits on the cornea, therefore it's no longer as popular. Uh, for children, we can still use levofloxacin eye drops, but most commonly used current generation uh, fluoroquinolones include getifloxacin and moxifloxacin. Moxifloxacin is also given intracamerally as prophylaxis for endophthalmitis after every cataract surgery. It is useful in bacterial conjunctivitis and in corneal ulcer also. So moxifloxacin acts by working uh, on the topoisomerases 2 and 4 of the bacterial DNA and it prevents their replication. If you are suspecting a gram-negative bacilli, aminoglycosides need to be used. So usually in bacterial ulcers, where we usually have mixed infection, once you send scrapings of the cornea and send it for culture and sensitivity, and once you get the report back, and for if you have gram-negative bacilli, then tobramycin is added. So neomycin is not a very preferred aminoglycoside because it has its fair share of adverse effects. For chlamydial infections, especially when trachoma was very rampant, tetracycline was used a lot, but not so much these days. Chloramphenicol also worked well on chlamydia. And uh, it's a broad spectrum drug, but again, not very commonly used currently. Vancomycin is very, very popularly used when it comes to endophthalmitis. It is also used in refractory corneal ulcers. It's very effective against methicillin resistant staph aureus. Uh, in some scenarios, polymyxin B and neomycin combination also works. Um, well against staph aureus and strep species and it's usually used uh, topically as an ointment or if you have blepharitis now blepharitis if you recall uh, is an infection of the eyelashes and the related follicles so we need to tell the patient to maintain lid hygiene and put an antibiotic ointment so as to break the cycle of infection so I guess with this, we would conclude this session and I would request you to stay tuned for part two, which will have antivirals, antifungals, anti-inflammatory and anti-allergics. So I invite um, questions from all of you and suggestions to make the part two better if uh, you found me to be a little bit too bookish as regards, you know, the drugs. I'm welcome to the suggestions to make it better the next time. Thank you so much. We have a question from uh, Bhupendra. He says, what to do when there is an injury to the eye, but the patient puts drops in the eye, ignoring the injury and the pH becomes more acidic. I think pH is the last concern for me. The eye drops are meant to be put on an intact surface. Whenever there is an injury and there is a breach in the cornea, the breach 
question the integrity of the uh, quotes of the i in those cases drops should not be put what i mean to say is that if there is a penetrating eye injury there is a laceration in those cases topical eye drops should not be put and the patient should be admitted and the repair of the tissue should be done but if there is just a corneal abrasion or if there is just a partial thickness injury then you can definitely give uh, eye drops which are not acidic and which coat the surface longer and then address depending upon the disease entity you are we are talking about but if there is a tear in the coats of the eye then the drug that you put in as a drop will go and it will be absorbed by the macula and it will be maculotoxic so you know we don't really prescribe drops if there is a corneal tear or a penetrating eye injury uh you asked what is the reason for eye redness i assume you are asking about conjunctival hyperemia after prostaglandin analog installation and after uh, the installation of alpha agonists well it's the nature of the drug itself which is causing hyperemia uh but the hyperemia is very transient after 15 to 20 days of drug installation the receptors sort of become used to the drug and it just goes away so whenever you start a patient on prostaglandin analogs we always tell them that don't be worried about the redness if it's not causing you any uh, functional disability because the redness will go away in 2 to 3 weeks but if it still persists then we change the drug um we are advised not to not cram things up but mbbs has so much information so what to do in order to feel good about myself i have only option of remembering things well yeah i agree with you there is so much to learn and uh, we have no shortcut for it because as doctors you always have to learn till the end of your life so let's make learning fun and you know add some fun elements so that you remember things that's the only thing i suggest i mean even at this age i'm reading every day and there is so much i don't know and there is so much i want to learn so yeah all the best uh, that's what i can say how to think like a pg doctor in mbbs itself i want to extract maximum clinical essence i would just say that for a pg doctor or for a good doctor try to learn the basics if you know the basics and you know that if this is the problem i would want to do this it's just putting two and two together if you mug up that this is 15% and 30% have redness then it's no fun but if you know that this patient has redness but i want to address it by giving say any other drug uh, and you want to explain this to the patient and you take interest in their problem you write down how the patient's disease or symptoms are changing it becomes interesting so be involved in whatever patient you are seeing eventually it's the books will be translated into patients you are reading right now but whatever you are reading has to be applied to a person so if you add that human connection to whatever you are reading i think it will be more fun and you can start thinking like a doctor did you know you would do ophthalmology while doing mbbs no i didn't know i did not even want to do a surgical branch but you know <laughs> it just worked out how did i choose my branch um, i made a table of pros and cons of each branch i ended up like this but i'm happy being an ophthalmologist so i hope you all become happy in whatever you choose we all have limited control over our subject choice you know these days um yeah rajat all the best uh, you had a lot of queries and i think they are very relevant and very important and uh, yes my anatomy is not so good our college professors did not teach anatomy you know nobody can teach you anatomy you learn it with experience so i also don't remember a lot of things but you know once you start operating and once you start seeing things you'll remember don't worry ma'am also add anesthetic drug agents yes next time i'll cover anesthetic agents and uh, anesthetic agents are very important because uh, when you are giving blocks in the eye to numb the eye and uh, even as topical agents also they're quite relevant i'll do that thank you for pointing it out what to do in case of glaucoma leads to almost blindness to the patient 
um, there are several drugs now which can be very effective till a very long time in a patient in a patient's life you know it all depends when the patient comes to us in india unfortunately many patients living in rural areas they report to the doctor only when they are almost at the verge of losing their sight so in those patients we really can't help much but though, if the disease is detected in time we have good medications now fortunately and the patients usually don't really go blind in their lifetime uh okay jeevan you were asking about uh, corneal ablation when you uh, probably asked initially yeah so in a casualty management of corneal ablation i would put an antibiotic ointment and patch the eye so abrasions usually heal beautifully overnight so you patch the eye with an ointment patch it up tell the patient to open it after you know 24 hours and it it usually heals and if it's a big abrasion the size starts getting smaller so the patients can keep removing the patch put their eye drop put the patch back the patching really works wonders uh nivitha asked me mention some important topic in uveitis so if we are talking about mbbs in uveitis uh, being able to differentiate between granulomatous and non granulomatous uveitis is very important the non granulomatous uveitis is the common you know Uh, acute idiopathic uveitis that we see in our OPDs day in and day out. The granulomatous one is very important when it comes to systemic connection, because a lot of connective tissue disorders they result in granulomatous uveitis. So yeah, I would say uh, you should be prepped up to understand the common differentiating features between the two and the um, investigative modality for uveitis. That's really very relevant. So. if you want we can take uveitis as an individual topic um, in one of the subsequent sessions uh, but yes uh, any suggestions for making the uh, next part of this more uh, fun for you i've tried to put in a lot of clinically relevant stuff this time uh, but if you have any suggestions you are most welcome to share